this is a reading from a discourse titled What is This World? and it's by P.R. Sarkar and uh, it's come from the book titled Ananda Marga Elementary Philosophy. It also appeared in the book Ananda Marga Philosophy in a Nutshell Part 1. Um, what he's saying about ether from the Tantra Yoga perspective. So it was saying here, the earth was created from the sun and the sun is only a, a ball of fire, the existence of which is dependent on certain gases found primarily in the aerial factor. Uh, the sun therefore depends for its existence on the aerial factor and has originated from it. Similarly, the aerial factor, Vayu, is dependent on the ethereal factor because if there were no ether, there would be no space for the air to exist. The origin of air can be traced to ethereal factor. We can trace back the ethereal factor to the source of the air, sun, earth, and then human beings. So he's talking about the five fundamental factors known in uh, Sanskrit as Panchabhuta. So again, this is from the Tantra Yoga cosmology. Five fundamental factors, um, ether or ethereal factor, aerial factor, luminous factor, light, liquid factor, then solid factor. Five fundamental factors. Let's carry on. A human being has unit consciousness and so the ethereal factor must also have it. A human being has unit consciousness and so the ethereal factor must also have it. If it did not have consciousness, how could a human being who has been created from it have unit consciousness? The ethereal factor is crude. It has no shape nor can its size be measured. It contains nothing and is void, yet it is called crude because sound can travel through it. The fact that sound waves can be formed in it shows that there must be something which makes sound waves possible and which gives ether a crude character. Although ether is called crude, it has no crude substance in it. It is nothingness, void or just space. But logically, it has to be admitted that it contains consciousness. Otherwise, human beings who have been formed from the ether would not be able to get unit consciousness. Hence, the only entity which can be in the ether is consciousness. For instance, we find water in ice because it is made of water and contains nothing except water. Similarly, ether, which contains nothing except consciousness, has to be made of consciousness. Consciousness is in Brahma, and so ether has its origin only in Brahma. Brahma here meaning the supreme consciousness or the supreme being. Thus, the ethereal factor or Vyom Matatwa has originated from Brahma, as has the rest of the universe, as the origin of air, fire, water, earth, and the entire plant and animal kingdom has been shown to originate only from the ethereal factor. Therefore, the entire creation is only made of Brahma, again, supreme consciousness. Brahma alone is the cause of the creation of the universe. Creation is the thought projection of Saguna Brahma. Now, Saguna Brahma, Brahma again is the supreme being. Saguna Brahma is referring to the supreme being in the role of controller of the creation. It's controlling the creation through the gunas, which is why it is called Saguna. Sar is meaning with. So Saguna Brahma is meaning the supreme being who is with the gunas, literally meaning using the gunas to create the creation. How, and these gunas we know are three, that they are binding principles used by this, the, um, the ultimately the um, Supreme Being, but practically through the Supreme Operative Principle that we've talked about before. So the Supreme Being is made up on the one side of Cosmic Consciousness, on the other side, Cosmic Operative Principle. It is that faculty to operate, that operative principle that enables it to start operating on a portion of cosmic consciousness in order to create the creation. So there are three gunas that are these binding principles that are binding that consciousness in 
all the myriad ways that lead to the creation happening. Uh, and they are called Sattva Guna, which is the most subtle of the binding principles. The second is called Raja Guna, which is the middle point. And the third is called Tama Guna, which is the static principle in which there is the maximum um, binding on consciousness by the uh, static force or the static principle or Tama Guna. And this Raja Guna is in between and it can move to the subtle, to the sattva, or it can move to the crude, to the um, static or the Tama Guna. So the creation is a thought projection of Saguna Brahma. How this creation has been formed in the imagination of Saguna Brahma needs explanation. Rama, although in Bhagalpur, can create Chaurangi in his imagination. His cheetah takes the form of Chaurangi when his Aham Tattva thinks of it. Aham Tattva being the ego portion of the mind, meaning the, the I feeling centered on I do. The feeling of I do. So when a human being is acting in, in their Aham Tattva at the unit level, they are acting with the feeling of I do. I am doing this. I am the doer of this action. Where there's that sense that is coming from Aham Tattva. Rama's Chita. Chita is the objectified portion of the mind. Chita is a part of his mind. And Rama creates Chaurangi in his mind. Similarly, Saguna Brahma has created the universe in its imagination. Its chitta, objectified mind, has become the universe as a result of the thinking of its aham tattva. So the aham tattva is doing the thinking with the consciousness of I am creating, I am doing, and the chitta takes the form of it. As chitta is a part of the mind of Saguna Brahma, the universe has been created in the mind of Saguna Brahma. Remember, Brahma is the Supreme Being. It has already been seen that in order to take the form of Chaurangi, Rama's Chita, a subtle entity, becomes like Chaurangi, a crude object. In order to take the form of a crude object, Chita has to change from subtle to crude. This change cannot happen suddenly. Chita has to gradually become crude, and then alone can it take the form of Chaurangi, a crude object, properly. Chaurangi is a, is a city in India. If milk has to be made into kira, a thick milk product obtained by boiling away the watery portion, it cannot be done quickly. The milk has to be boiled until it gradually becomes thicker. Only then does it adopt the thick form of kira. In the same way, Saguna Brahma's subtle chita gradually crudifies and finally takes the crude form of kititatwa, solid. Hence, creation, which is the transformation of chitta as a result of the crudification of chitta, must have gradually become crude from its subtle state. Wow, this is interesting. Let's reflect on this for a moment. So the key point here is Saguna Brahma's subtle chitta. So Saguna Brahma is the consciousness entity, the supreme consciousness, in fact, but it is the supreme being engaged with the process of using the gunas to bind consciousness to create. And it's saying the subtle chitta of Saguna Brahma, chitta now is implying that mind has already been formed. So with what mind? Cosmic mind. So from Saguna Brahma being the ultimate witnessing entity allows its faculty of operative principle to operate, to function, and to crudify a portion of itself, of its cosmic consciousness, creating in the first instance the subtle part of cosmic mind being the I am. So where there's the cosmic mind gets the sense of it exists, this I am, known in Sanskrit as Mahatattva. And then as that um, operative principle then functions on a portion of the cosmic I am or the cosmic Mahat then it, it creates a second portion of cosmic mind called the cosmic Aham Tattva the cosmic I do or the cosmic ego and then as a portion of that cosmic ego gets subjected to the supreme operative principle and subjected to metamorphosis or crudification we get the creation of the cosmic cheetah. 
and that cheetah is taking the form of what the cosmic ego thinks. So that's the point to understand there about chitta. So it's saying Saguna, Brahma's subtle chitta, gradually crudifies and finally takes the crude form of Kititatwa, solid. Hence creation, which is a transformation of chitta as the result of the crudification of chitta, must have gradually become crude from its subtle state. Why that's interesting is it's talking about the uh, this particular Tantra cosmology's perception of the creation. So whereas modern day uh, science claims the Big Bang um, as the beginning point of the creation, here it's, it's actually saying it quite different, differently. It's saying actually uh, the creation is formed within the cosmic cheetah and that gradually crudifies until it finally takes the crude form of kititatwa, which is solid factor, going back again to those five fundamental factors we talked about earlier, being ethereal factor, aerial factor, luminous factor, liquid factor, and then finally kititatwa, or solid factor. So it's saying here, there is a gradual crudification of the cosmic chitta that will lead finally to the form of solid factor. So solid factor in this account is the uh, maximum point of, of metamorphosis or cr of crudification of its essence which is that original portion of supreme consciousness. And the solid factor contains according to this account also liquid factor, luminous factor aerial factor and also ethereal factor or ether. So each successive factor contains within it a part of the factor that it came from. So but solid factor will therefore contain f the five factors themselves. Carrying on. Hence creation which is the transformation of cheetah as a result of the crudification of cheetah must have gradually come crude become crude from its subtle state. That's, that's nice, that's interesting, I learned that, something new there. Carrying on, Saguna Brahma created the universe in its chitta by gradually crudifying its subtle self. How did creation become crude from subtle? Prakriti, now this word Prakriti is referring to Das and Kititatwa, solid factor, both Prakriti Supreme Operative Principle and Purusha, Cosmic Consciousness, have become inanimate. Purusha cannot become cruder and Prakriti cannot qualify him any further to make him still cruder. When Purusha and Prakriti have both reached their limits of manifestation, the question arises if this is the end of creation. Another question also arises about the presence of animate objects like plants and animals if Kititat was the final stage of creation. These do not appear anywhere in the formation of creation from subtle into crude. How and when these were formed is a very pertinent question. Okay, so anyway, this is talking about ether. That's the, the focus of our uh, inquiry in this recording. And uh, here's another uh, discourse again from P.R. Sarkar. And the discourse is titled Matter and Spirit. The Supreme Self lies hidden deep within every object. It is impossible for the crude organs to see or understand this deeply caverned entity. Take ether, for instance. Akasha Tatwa or ether lies hidden in the molecules and atoms of every object. Do you see it with your crude eyes or can you feel its existence through any of your organs? Now an illiterate man may ask a scientist, you say there is ether. If there is, then show me. It is useless to laugh at the ignorant man. He has to be guided and directed to the appropriate state of understanding its existence. Only then will he accept the existence of ether fully because his intellect and intelligence has risen above the common intellect of the ordinary non-scientific person. Brahma Tattva, or the spiritual principle, is an extremely subtle principle. So to understand or know him certainly calls for a very subtle and sagacious intellect, as sharp as the point of a needle. The scripture call it Agriya Buddhi or pointed intellect. 
The Jama, the mythological god of death, philosophically the controller, has said that this truth can only be experienced through Agriya Bhuti, this pointed intellect. No other bearing can comprehend it. That is why the deeply caverned supreme being is not equally reflected on all minds, in spite of the fact that he is present in all entities and is, and is indeed the essence of every entity. It is only when the mental mirror becomes pure with the help of Agriya Bhuti that the supreme entity is properly revealed. This spiritual principle is beyond the comprehension of the crude organs like the eyes, etc. PR Sarkar from the discourse Some Questions and Answers on Anandamaga Philosophy. Question 15. Is there any fundamental difference between mind stuff, chitta, and itha, vyoma, tatwa? If so, why? Answer. No, there is no fundamental difference. Both originate from consciousness. In reality, there is no non-living entity. Everything has consciousness. Due to the bondage of prakriti, again, supreme operative principle, consciousness sometimes appears to be in the form of the crude five fundamental factors, sometimes in a subtle psychic form, and at other times in the form of causal consciousness. Mind is that stage of consciousness where the domination of prakriti, supreme operative principle, is less than that present in the five fundamental factors. Again, mind is that stage of consciousness where the domination of prakriti is less than that present in the five fundamental factors. This next section is again PR Sarkar, Discourse, the Expansion of the Microcosm. While discussing a subtle entity, one is continuously reminded of the ethereal factor, the subtlest factor of this perceivable world. That is why people loosely describe Brahma as being like ether or beyond ether. This supreme entity who is as subtle as ether, in fact, he is much, much subtler than that, is called Akara because he is not transmuted from the original stance. Conversely, the entity or entities which have been transmuted and are undergoing various transmutations are called Kara. Only the supreme entity, Parama Purusha, is, or Parama, yeah, Parama Purusha, is Akra. The various emanations of the supreme entity which are subject to constant change are known as devatas, mythological gods or deities. Again, the various emanations of the supreme entity which are subject to constant change are known as devatas, mythological gods or deities. These devatas or divine emanations lie embedded in the cosmic body. Brahma is the source of infinite energy. Whatever has been created or is being created or will be created is a vibrational flow emanating from him. The seed of all emanation lies embedded in him. The controlling faculties of the vibrational flows are called devatas. Again, the controlling faculties of the vibrational flows are called devatas. Now that's interesting there because what came to my mind was in indigenous cultures how certain uh, entities are believed to be the controlling factors, for example, of water, of thunder, of air, of wind, of volcanoes. <clears throat> so in a way, there's a slight parallel here, but it's put in these terms. Again, the controlling faculties of the vibrational flows are called devatas. These devatas or divine emanations have no absolute or separate identity. The manifestation of this relative universe is called by the collective expression. The sound created by the vibrational expression of each devata in which its potentiality of expression lies is called its acoustic root and the totality of these acoustic roots is called omkara, omkara or pranav. Hence omkara is the seed of the cosmos. Now that would be something interesting to explore again from this new physics perspective, this post-quantum uh, uh, physics that we're currently uh, experiencing. 
so this new paradigm physics and it's it's talking about the sound created by the vibrational expressions um, <clears throat> and the acoustic root the totality of these acoustic roots is called Ankara or Pranav yeah so uh, that would be something that our, f our new paradigm physical science could sort of s maybe uh, start exploring the acoustic emanations that come from these vibrational expressions within the uh, manifested body of the cosmic entity. Those who worship the various deities in pursuit of artha, mundane wealth, and not paramata, supreme wealth, do so because those deities are the controllers of the transient wealth of the universe. Fascinating concept. Let's look at that again. So it's talking about these devatas, these deities again. Those who worship the various deities in pursuit of artha, artha, mundane wealth, and not paramata, supreme wealth, do so because those deities are the controllers of the transient wealth of the universe. Fascinating. Those who worship these deities to attain Brahma will be sadly disappointed for it is impossible to attain the infinite through the worship of the finite. The one who declares that a particular deity is Brahma may have an element of devotion but must be totally devoid of rationality. That part's beautiful and, and important to reflect on. So Devata is a particular vibrational flow whereas Brahma is the ocean of universal flows, the ocean of divine nectar. It is totally unnecessary for a spiritual aspirant to worship any particular deity. The Rishi says, means the sage, for one who has not realized Brahma, ritualistic worship, the study of the scriptures, religious pilgrimages, charitable activities or scriptural recitation are all meaningless. For one who has not realized Brahma, ritualistic worship, the study of the scriptures, religious pilgrimages, charitable activities or scriptural recitations are all meaningless. Such ritualistic observances devoid of cosmic ideation do not deserve to be called anything less than ostentatious public displays or pretentious demonstrations of intellectual vanity. I'm wondering whether that means, uh, actually means for one who has realized Brahma then these other practices are all meaningless. But it's saying for one who has not realized Brahma. So yeah, maybe that's a, a spelling error there. Only that person, let me try that again. Okay, so carrying on. Only that person who remains free from all superstitions moves towards the Supreme Entity with genuine devotion and one point of ideation on him and whose inner soul runs unhindered towards the cosmic soul attains him, attains everything in life, and attaining him gets merged in him. Merging in the ocean of nectar, one also becomes nectar. Hence the Vedas declare Brahma vid Brahmaiva Pavati. One who knows Brahma becomes Brahma. This imperishable Parama Brahma is the paramount topic of the Vedas. Many people think that the Vedas only teach the worship of Brahma, but it discusses so many other subjects such as Chanda, Rhythm, Mantra, Holy Chants, Vyakarana, Grammar, and a host of other rules and regulations, do's and don'ts. Should we study all the Vedas' teachings? In reply, one can only say that one may accept the essence of something without accepting its non-essential aspects. If someone says, I eat wood apple, it doesn't mean that he eats its skin, seeds or gum. Similarly, to eat a mango does not mean to devour its skin and stone, but to eat the essential part, discarding the rest. So to accept a scripture means to accept the essence which stands the test of rationality and to discard the rest. Rational people should never declare that the teachings of the scriptures should be followed blindly. Okay, so a lot of wisdom obviously in that. Um, and just a reminder here, the perspective taken by the author here, P.R. Sarkar, uh, is actually Tantra. So uh, it's the Tantra perspective that we are hearing here. 
This next discourse, PR Sarkar, from This World and the Next. And it says here, Had there been no sound, the mind would not have felt the necessity of the ear organ, and so it would not have evolved. It is entirely dependent on the sound tanmatras and akasha tatwa itha. So since the organs are dependent upon the fundamental factors for their existences, they are only relative truths. Whatever is relative truth we may call padata, matter. What do we understand by padata? Pada means rank and artha means meaning or significance. So none of the padatas are absolutely pervasive. They appear in certain conditions and in certain conditions they disappear and so they are not absolute supreme truth. Sadakas, spiritual practitioners, must endeavor to realize the characteristic self, that supreme being. They must do the sadhana, the spiritual practices of the absolute, not the sadhana of the organs or the senses. The organs are not the swarupa or characteristic self. They are only attributes of temporal, spatial and personal factors. An attribute which exists today will disappear tomorrow and thus cannot be regarded as Swarupa. The thing upon which the attributes are ascribed is indeed the Swarupa. The sense attributes carry the identities of the unit entity in a number of ways such as the seer, the hearer, etc. But what will happen if there is no witnessing entity behind the faculties of knowing and seeing? In the absence of that witnessing entity, the Supreme One, everything will appear to be non-existent. PR Sarkar, the goal of human ideation. And we have here a question and it is saying the five rudimental factors, that is ether, air, gas, liquid and solid, these five rudimental factors when combined together, B, how are they created? In the beginning, I should say the supreme causal factor was one, Eko Hung Bahushyam. I am one, I shall become many. In the beginning, there was only one entity and there was nothing else. This entity, this Parama Brahma, Supreme Brahma or Supreme Being, comprises two aspects, the cognitive and the operative aspect. In other words, cosmic consciousness and the supreme operative principle, here called the operative aspect. These two aspects together constitute one supreme entity. That was a state where there was no scope of expression. The seed was there, but there was no scope of expression. So in that state, ultimately, Parama Purusha imagined, Supreme Consciousness imagined, I am one today, but let me be many. Eko hung bahushyam. PR Sarkar, unity in diversity. Parama Purusha, Supreme Consciousness, is the original fundament of this universe. The entire universe originated from Him, meaning from that entity, and uh, it has nothing to do with the gender uh, words that we use uh, here in English language. The entire universe originated from Him, is maintained in Him, and finally will dissolve in unto Him. I think that should say into Him. The crude, subtle and the causal universe is only the projection of the macro-psychic imagination. Due to the influence of Prakriti, the supreme operative principle, which was manifested by the will of Parama Purusha, supreme consciousness, the five fundamental factors, ether, air, fire, liquid and solid, emerged in the flow of cosmic imagination. This entire colorful universe is a, conden is a condensed form of countless inferential waves. Prana, or life, occurred as a result of internal clash and cohesion within the material structure. Subsequently, at a different stage, at different stages of evolution, various unicellular living beings emerged and finally human beings with a developed brain evolved. In the process of evolution from an unknown point, the vast creation of nebulae, the solar world, stars, planets and satellites, creepers, shrubs, trees, flowers and foliage, rivers, clouds, oceans, hills, forests and meadows, and towns and cities took shape. 
But the original cause is the one infinite, omnipresent, omniscient entity, Parama Purusha, Supreme Consciousness. People sometimes wrongly think that time, nature, destiny, accident, the fundamental factors or unit consciousness are the fundamental cause of creation. But on deep analysis, one can only conclude that none of them can be recognized as an original cause of creation because each is limited. Materialists accept this perceivable creation as the absolute reality and deny everything beyond the scope of the senses. This betrays their deep ignorance. They do not want to understand that matter is absolutely, de absolutely dependent on time, space and person for its existence. Matter comes out of energy and energy comes out of idea. Beautiful. Again, matter comes out of energy and energy comes out of idea. And Parama Purusha is the metempirical entity. The metempirical entity. They do not want, I think that's meaning beyond empirical or beyond the crude, beyond the uh, physical. Parama Purusha is a metempirical entity. They do not want to recognize this supreme causal factor from whom countless vibrations are emanating and in whom, in whom all entities finally dissolve. In reality, whatever we normally accept as a fundamental material cause of this colorful creation, whether the molecule, atom, electron, or etheron, is only the expression of energy. Moreover, energy itself is not an original entity, but a particular manifestation of the static influence of Prakriti, the eminent principle of Parama Purusha, Supreme Consciousness. So to know the fundamental factor of an object, one will have to know Brahma, the composite of Shiva and Shakti, in other words, cosmic consciousness and cosmic or supreme operative principle. And one will, and one who has known Parama Purusha, the nucleus of all vibrations, has merged into Parama Purusha. Brahmavid Brahmaiva Pavati. Microscopic bondages will be removed, doubts and confusions will vanish, and an unending stream of pure bliss will flow in one's mind and heart. Each and every dust particle and every molecule and atom will appear to be as sweet as honey to such a realized person. This is an interesting concept in our Tantra cosmology. It's called Jadas Fota. Jadas Fota. And it's from the concept of Guna Bivyakti and Jadas Fota. Jadas Fota means material explosion of any physical body. In the process of centrifugal movement in Sanchara, the extroversial phase of creation going from subtle to crude, namely uh, consciousness to solid factor. In the process of centrifugal movement in Sanchara, the material body composed of five fundamental factors comes into being. But even after that stage, the static Prakriti exerts her crudifying force. And we know that involves Tama Guna, the binding principle um, out of the three, the crudest of the binding principles. This external pressure from static Prakriti is known as Bala. As a result of this Bala, two opposing forces develop, one centrifugal and the other centripetal in character. The center-seeking or inertial centripetal force tries to maintain the structural solidarity of the object, while the centrifugal one has a facipitous tendency, that is, it tries to split up the object into thousands. When the structural solidarity of anything is maintained, it means that in the in that particular unit structure, all the component five factors are in requisite proportion. Again, when the structural solidarity of anything is maintained, it means that in that particular unit structure, all the component five factors are in requisite proportion. And on the mutual cohesion amongst these factors depends the resultant and interior or the prana. But if the exterior forces win, the resultant exterior cannot form any nucleus within that physical structure. The resultant interior force, therefore, is the only factor that can create a nucleus within a solid body and thereby maintain its structural solidarity. 
Even if the structural solidarity of the unit be maintained, there can be spaces or portions within the unit structure where the exterior forces dominate over the reacting materials. In such a portion, dissociation occurs and the portions under the influences of a resultant exterior force get detached from the parent body. This is wear and tear experienced in our unit structure. The physical deficiency caused by this wear and tear is compensated by the prana energy or vital energy we acquire from food, light, air, water, etc. Again, in such, a, in such a portion, dissociation occurs and the portions under the influence of a resultant exterior force get detached from the parent body. This is wear and tear experienced in our unit structure. The physical deficiency caused by this wear and tear is compensated by the prana, energy or vital energy, we acquire from food, air, light, air, water, etc. So the physical deficiency caused by this wear and tear is compensated by the prana we acquire from the food, light, air, water. The wear and tear within a physical structure results in the deficiency of some factor or other and may also tell upon the resultant activity controlling the subjective nucleus and maintaining structural solidarity. Now if the deficiency caused thereby is not adequately compensated and if the requisite proportion of any factor or factors is not met, the resultant interior will begin varying in intensity and the unit structure may lose its solidarity. Even if the resultant interior be the winning factor in prana, the physical structure will split up into innumerable subtler particles if the atmospherical condition be not congenial to the expression of the vital energy. In the absence of a proper environment, life does not get an expression. The static prakriti continues exerting external pressure or bala on the unit's structure. Consequently, a stage will come when there will be little interatomic space within this solid body. Now, if the static prakriti exerts more pressure, the equipoise of the component elements gets lost and there will be a tremendous reaction within the physical body, affecting both the interior and exterior forces, resulting in structural dissociation. This is called jatasphota. Jatasphota occurs only in dead or dying celestial bodies in a living celestial body the existing congenial environment will be the cause of transformation of prana into prana this eliminates the chance of jadis photo again jadis photo occurs only in dead or dying celestial bodies in a living celestial body the existing congenial environment will be the cause of transformation of prana into prana prana meaning life uh, here, so it's going from vital energy into life. This eliminates the chance of jadis photo. These jadis photos can be instantaneous or gradual. Conditions for its instantaneous occurrence have been described above. But if due to exterior forces of prana, dissociation occurs gradually in some portions of the structure, the phenomenon of bursting up becomes gradual. Due to jadis photo, the component factors of the physical structure get associated into the five fundamental factors. The ethereal element of the cosmic mind gets gradually cruder, cruder and cruder as per degrees of the ever-increasing flow of the gunas, these binding principles. The more the progress of these metamorphoses, the more varied the attributional peculiarities noticeable in the material bodies and their dimensions also get shrunk and diminished. The dimensional contraction means the increase of internal frictions and this happens due to the excess of mag or magnitude of the external attributional flow. Due to these excessive internal frictions, explosions take place in the material bodies and they get pulverized into subtler elements. Now, I think this idea of Judas photo is important again in the context of our search for the new paradigm of physics and our movement towards this more expanded physics concept that reclaims again ether. So a lot of uh, what we've been exploring here in these readings of P.R. Saka are focused around ether. But of course, uh, I have definitely gone off on, on many tangents as well. Jadis Fota, I think, is important and there were some important concepts conveyed here. Um, and let's go through some of them. 
The process of centrifugal movement in Sanchara, the material composed of five fundamental factors, comes into being. So one word that I'm hearing in the in the realm of the new physics is the importance of the centripetal and the centrifugal movements. And that's interesting that we have the same language used here in our Tantra uh, philosophy, though it's being used in a different sense. But we're just looking for any intersecting points here. And then the idea of um, of I think it was structural explosion um, or rather material expo explosion of a physical body. I guess in some sense I was thinking in terms of the Big Bang concept because that remains another challenge um, for us to find parallels between the concept of Big Bang um, in our mainstream science and the cosmology of Tantra where there is no Big Bang as the uh, originating point of the creation whatsoever. In fact, we read several times earlier on in this recording that it, it appears to be exactly the opposite. It is a, a gradual um, metamorphosis or crudification of cosmic chitta to form the uh, creation, including the material portion of it, uh, as in Kiti Tatwa or solid factor. So the word used several times there was gradual, it's a gradual process. So that doesn't at all line up with the Big Bang concept. But what may f line up with the Big Bang concept is this concept of Jadis Photo, material explosion. However, it's said there at some point, I'm not even sure where, that the um, yeah, just photo occurs only in dead or dying celestial bodies. Um, it means Jadis photo isn't happening at the start of the creation. It's, it may happen, well, it does happen at a certain ongoing phase of it when the creation is somehow already manifested and we have these, these um, dead or dying celestial bodies. So that doesn't really line up with the idea of, of explosion as being a starting point.